and that's the kind of recognition we want to give to Ken Southward, who's a dentist who received his dental degree a very, very, very long time ago in Toronto. The, the neat thing is, is that when you get this kind of experience, you can look back and those, uh, those gray hairs actually mean something serious. He achieved his fellowship in the AGD in 1980. That's a long time ago. He's now a life member. He has enjoyed a prevention-oriented dental practice in Ontario for 43 years, retired from active practice, thank goodness, to focus on dental research. Has anybody seen his articles? I mean, this guy thinks weird, okay? He actually thinks that the tooth is something other than just a piece of ceramic stuck in your jaw. So we're going to talk today about how all that works. What a pleasure, doctor. Thank, Thank you, John. Thank you so much, you bet. And you're wired up, let's go. Yeah, I am, I think I'm good. <coughs> good morning. And uh, thank you for your uh, kind introduction there, John. I, I guess I should read this. I do not have any financial interest in a product of my talk or with any companies offering grant monies for this continuing dental and medical education program. So housekeeping details out of the way. The systemic theory of causation of dental decay and the role of vitamin K2. Well, that's a nice title for the brochure and things like that. But what this infers is that the decaying, rotting, or cariesing of teeth is merely a local manifestation of a system-wide process. And nutrition plays the most significant role. Note the shift in emphasis from the noun form, causation of dental disease or dental decay, to the process or verb form, decaying of teeth. This would be similar to saying, you have measles, noun, as opposed to verses, you are measling, verb. The first one says, oh, you have measles, that's a thing, we can do something about it, fine. The second one, you are measling, says, well, geez, I have to know more about this. Why are you doing that? And it brings up a whole bunch of questions. How did you get it? Will it how long will you have it? Why is your body acting this way? So questioning is important in today's world. Paradigms. Paradigms are like maps to guide our beliefs and actions through an understanding of generally accepted truths. For example, we're in Savannah. And having a map, whether it's a paper map or a digital map, is very convenient to help us understand Savannah and get around. But if we wake up in Charleston, a map of Savannah is not only useless, but could cons uh, create considerable stress in our world. So with regard to a paradigm of dental disease, could the dentist describe our traditional paradigm? where we are now. Where might we go? Should we consider systemic links? How do we get there? Is nutrition a possible vehicle? And maybe the most important question of all, why would we go there? Why would we move from information on Saturday to action on Monday? <clears throat> this picture, or this schematic, is well known to all the dentists, Miller's acidogenic theory or paradigm. These overlapping circles basically describe the traditional dental world. For caries to happen in the middle there, you need a susceptible tooth surface. No tooth, no caries. Okay? You need cariogenic bacteria and you need to feed them things like sugar. And when you have all three coming together, then you have potential for dental caries. So, we have set up our whole offices and our protocols to deal with this paradigm. Cariogenic bacteria, well, that's why we teach people how to brush and floss to reduce those. Di uh, reduce sugars. That seems to be the extent of most nutritional counseling in dental offices. Don't eat sugar, especially between meals. 
and susceptible tooth surface. Well, when we get enamel demineralization, we try to pile fluoride on it. We try to convince people to put fluoride in municipal water systems. And when you get a hole in the tooth, we put a filling in there to create a more cleansable surface. And that basically is all you need to know about the silo of dentistry as it has been over the last few decades. But we live in a changing world. Alvin Toffler back in the 1970s coined the term future shock. And a lot of people thought what he meant by that was that things were changing so rapidly that you couldn't keep up. No, he did not mean that at all. What he meant was that future shock is when the world changes and you are totally unprepared. Take, for example, <clears throat> a riverine culture of uh, people living on a river, and over generations they have learned to fish better with hooks and, and uh, better nets. They've learned to uh, uh, clean their fish better. They've learned to cure it better, to preserve it. And generation after generation they become better and better at this and they're well supported. But what they don't know is that a few miles upstream a dam is being built. And tomorrow, it is going to close off their section of the river. All the riverine culture that they ever had is going to be useless in tomorrow's world. And only those who can shift to an agrarian culture will survive. Peter Drucker, when he wrote, he used the example back in the 1940s, he said the railroads had a choice of defining their business. Why didn't the railroads found the airlines? They had the ticket agencies, they had the hotels, they had the support services, but they defined their business or their paradigm was we drive trains. <clears throat> if they had worked in a paradigm or defined their business as moving people and cargo, founding the airlines would have been a fairly obvious uh, next step. Look, what's, look what Craigslist and Kijiji have done to classified newspaper advertising, Uber to the taxi industry, Airbnb to hotels. The internet is connecting and empowering people like never before. And asking the right questions is the most valuable asset we can have today as professionals. As we move to a noun to a verb world of process rather than things, we say, well, is this a car? Or is it a, a way to move people? Should we include entertainment? Should we include climate control? How about a map? How about onboard map? And do we really need a driver? Do we really need ownership of the car? So will the dental paradigm be changed by disruptive technology? First, some questions for our, this is the buzzword these days, evidence-based dental paradigm. Why aren't acids Cariogenically equal. We know that acids from citrus, bulimia, gastroesophageal esophageal reflux disease all create specific patterns of enamel demineralization and erosion, but they're not usually associated with dental decay. Whereas soda pop and oral bacterial acids are. Well, they're all acids, but the last two are definitely associated with dental decay, first three are not. Hard to explain in the acidogenic theory. Why can we not create dentin caries in vitro, in the lab? Why does the dentin caries process stop at the death of the host? Why does crystal meth cause so much caries devastation? Is it that these people really don't care? Why is milk considered non-cariogenic while cheese is considered anti-cariogenic? And why are some children more susceptible to early childhood caries? We, these are problems for our traditional paradigm to answer. Let's start off by stating that enamel erosion and dentin caries are two entirely different processes. Is that process? Is that a Canadian? Is it process? American? I, I can't tell. Whichever one it is. Okay, Miller's acidogenic theory sees caries as a localized process of acid attack, period. The 
Denton Carey's process, however, is accomplished by an inflammatory reaction involving the body's own matrix metalloproteinases, or MMPs, such as collagenase. This was nicely demonstrated by the Finnish researchers Tatarhani and Sorza. Remember that name Tatarhani, it'll show up later in the presentation. So they found that similar to the mainstream periodontal process that we have, where you get bacterial endotoxins chronically irritating the gingiva, which creates a chronic inflammatory situation and eventual breakdown of the periodontal tissues. Within the tooth, we see exactly the same thing. Constant acid irritation is creating a chronic inflammatory situation in the dentin of the tooth, which eventually leads to cavitation, which we recognize as dental caries. In a noun world, treatment is emphasized. I'm a restorative dentist because it is the same despite the cause. Who cares whether it's a local cause or a systemic cause? It's a noun and we're going to do the same thing. We're going to fill that tooth. The process is the important part in a verb world. Why is this tooth carriesing? <clears throat> so we have two questions answered out of those six already. Dentin caries cannot be created without an inflammatory response from the host, which is why it cannot be created in the lab or maintained after the death of the host. So we're talking about inflammation now. It's important that we all be on the same page. So let's do a little uh, schematic for inflammation. And I look at it as an equation uh, where one side equals the other. First of all, a redox or a reduction oxidation uh, reaction. There are biochemical reactions in the body. The Krebs cycle, for example, occurs in the mitochondria of the cell. From oxygen, it creates both energy in the form of ATP and carbon dioxide. Activities like respiration and metabolism require this energy just to sustain life. Reactive oxygen species out of the Krebs cycle are a type of free radical created like exhaust when the reaction is not perfect and nothing is ever perfect. A free radical is a molecule, atom or ion, with an unpaired electron. Nature does not like that. So that reactive oxygen species is now seeking an electron, preferably from an antioxidant. An antioxidant is a molecule that can give up an electron without in turn becoming toxic to the cell. If need be, that reactive oxygen species will take it from the lipids and proteins of the cell wall or from the cell's DNA. Visualize the fireplace. You got a couple logs on there. Fire's burning nicely. Every once in a while, a little crackle and a little cinder spits out and lands on the carpet. Well, one or two, you never notice that. But if you pile another few logs on there, or you increase that rate of metabolism in the cell and it spits out more cinders or the rate of metabolism spits out more reactive oxygen species and lands on the carpet or lands on the cell wall, eventually it's going to start to look a little bit ragged. So nature does not leave us unprotected. Nature creates antioxidants. So what we're going to do is we're going to put an antioxidant fire screen in between the fire and the carpet. So those cinders, when they're spit out, are intercepted before they create damage to the carpet. And those reactive oxygen species, when they're spit out of that Krebs cycle reaction, are going to get intercepted by antioxidants before they take electrons from the cell wall and the DNA. Glutathione, catalase, and superoxide dismutase are examples of endogenous or within this produced within the cell antioxidants. So we have the health equation. Oxidation equals antioxidation. It's equal, no damage, we call this health. 
Now we go on to the dis-ease equation. Now in this situation, oxidation is greater than the antioxidation. So we bring in controlled inflammation to make up the difference, okay? So let's say now we have either more oxidation or less antioxidation. Either one, it's just that if you had two parts, uh, four parts oxidation now and two parts antioxidation, there's two parts that have to be made up. So you get two parts of oxidative stress, which is managed by acute inflammation so the, I call it acute or controlled inflammation because when the equation is balanced, all the, inflammation, all the inflammation firemen go back to the fire hall and they're not needed anymore. So oxidative stress, we turn to Wikipedia for a definition of oxidative stress and you'll be able to see this very clearly now. Oxidative stress reflects an imbalance between the systemic manifestation of reactive oxygen species, that's the oxidation side, and a biological system's ability to readily detoxify the reactive intermediates, that's the antioxidant, or repair the resulting damage, that's the inflammation part. So we increase exercise one day, okay, more logs on the fire, more energy produced in the cell, creates oxidative stress, what do we have the next day? Sore muscles and joints. We don't exercise for a few days, equations balanced, inflammation goes back to normal. Sources of antioxidants do not all have to come from within the cell. They can be from outside the cell. So all reactive oxygen species are free radicals. They're looking for an electron. But not all free radicals are oxygen. For example, we can have reactive nitrogen species. And even worse, we can have things like heavy metals, mercury, which is a free radical generator. Now what that means is that you have this process going along, oxidation, antioxidation, da, 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 create whatever it needs, like energy in the cell. Then mercury comes along and it lodges into the chain. So if once in a while it dropped the ball and had a free radical, now every time it gets to that mercury molecule, that molecule, whether it be sulfur, or iron, or whatever, can't get its electron from where it normally gets it and every time it drops the ball. Now we have free radicals created all the time because you have mercury locked in the port there where it should be balancing off. I'm not the expert in this, but you are very fortunate to have a world expert on this in the person of Boyd Haley this afternoon. <clears throat> so antioxidants can also be both endogenous produced within the cell, or exogenous, such as fruits and vegetables, green tea, whatever. To, because this is a toxicology seminar, I wanted to find something that would explain uh, uh, oxidative stress and relate it to metal intoxication. And you don't have to go far. Here's one from 2008. This is quoted right out of the abstract. This review summarizes our current understanding about the mechanism by which metalloids or heavy metals, particularly arsenic, lead, cadmium, and mercury, induce their toxic effects. The unifying factor in determining toxicity and carcinogenicity for all of these metals is the generation of reactive oxygen and nitrogen species. The toxic manifestations of these metals are caused primarily due to imbalance between pro-oxidant and antioxidant homeostasis, which is termed as oxidative stress. Let's go on and expand our equations. Now we can expand the health equation. We can add endogenous or inside the cell antioxidants plus exogenous antioxidants from outside. And if they equal the endogenous and exogenous antioxidation, we have what we would know as disease resistance. 
Let's say, for example, that we add, I was going to use the example smoking, but I'm going to switch. I'm going to use the term, or the example, uh, endodontically treated tooth. One that's well treated won't create a lot of oxidation. Won't be perfect, but there'll be some. One that's poorly treated will create a lot of oxidation. Okay? But if you have an outside source of antioxidation, for example, a person drinks a lot of green tea, then you have it balances and it's called disease resistance. So a root canal tooth can be okay if it doesn't cause a lot of oxidation, but if it does cause a lot, out it goes. <clears throat> the expanded dis-ease equation, now we have inside and outside oxidation is greater than inside and outside antioxidation. We have controlled inflammation. Let's take a sunburn, for example. We go out in the sun someday, too much radiation, creates a lot of oxidative stress. We've got all the signs of inflammation the next day. We've got redness, swelling, heat, and pain. If we stay out of the sun for a few days, the equation balances. The inflammation firemen go back to the fire hall, and we're all back to normal. Maybe. Don't forget what we learned before, is that when those free radicals are looking for an electron, they could take it from the cell's DNA. And if you get enough sunburns over the year, that DNA can start to look pretty ragged, and what have we got? We've got a precancerous cell. And later on in life, we may see skin cancer. Now we come to the disease equation. This is a situation where inside and outside oxidation are greater than inside and outside antioxidation, but it's chronic over a long period of time. And now we have uncontrolled inflammation. We know that inflammation can be a double-edged sword. It can be our greatest friend as a defense mechanism, but when it goes overboard, then it starts to break our tissues down. So visualize a campfire. Controlled. Okay. Use it for heat. Cooking food. But when it becomes a forest fire, it becomes, creates huge amounts of devastation. Periodontal disease and dental caries are similar processes where when you go over the edge from acute phase to a chronic stage, then irreversible breakdown can, can occur, either in the periodontal tissues or in the tooth. So, now we can rephrase one of those questions on the first page. Why does acid from soda pop and oral bacteria stimulate an inflammatory response in the tooth's dentin while citrus bulimia and GERD typically do not. All tissues of the body need nourishment. They're either going to get it from a blood supply or a fluid flow. We owe a great debt of gratitude to the researchers Dr. Ralph Steinman, a dentist, and Dr. John Leonora, a physiologist, who worked through the 80s, 90s, and the early 2000s at Loma Linda University in California. They were able to determine that there's a centrifugal or inside to outside fluid flow through the dentin of the tooth in a healthy tooth, which enhances or resistance through nourishment and also cleanses the tooth. Figuratively, a tooth like this is sweating. They also found that a high sucrose diet can halt or reverse this fluid flow and create vulnerability. In, the, in, the, in, in a figurative sense, the tooth goes from sweating to more like a sponge. The book Dental Fluid Transport by Clyde Rogenkamp, published in I think 2008 or something like that, uh, with the 100th anniversary of Loma Linda uh, or some such celebration. Rogenkamp took all the research papers of Steinman and Leonora, put them in the book, but the advantage of the book is that you not only get the research uh, papers, but you get the questions, the questions that Steinman and Leonora were challenging themselves with all through their career. 
So they were able to determine that if there's a fluid flow through the tooth and it's variable, something must be controlling that. They went on did further experiments. They found that the parotid glands have both an exocrine function, hey, I learned that in dental school, to secrete saliva, but they also have an endocrine function to secrete parotid hormone. Say what? I didn't learn that. It is similar to the pancreas. Digestive enzymes secreted through the pancreatic duct into the small intestine, and insulin secreted into the bloodstream to manage blood sugar. They found also that the submandibular and sublingual salivary glands only have exocrine functions to secrete saliva. Then, thank goodness for Leonora being a physiologist and have a little bit broader scope, they found that signals from the hypothalamus part of the brain control both the pancreas and the parotid glands. Under normal circumstances, with parotid hormone stimulation, teeth have a centrifugal dentinal fluid flow, which creates resistance and nourishment. High sucrose diets halt to reverse it within minutes of ingestion. Concurrently, insulin is upregulated up while parotid hormone is downregulated. What's happening? Listen, let's listen to the conversation in the hypothalamus. All right, boys, you produce a bunch of uh, parotid stimulating hormone and keep those teeth nice and healthy. Whoa, hold on a sec. We've got high glucose. We've got glucose coming up in the, in, the, in the system. This is a much more life-threatening situation. We need all hands on deck. Forget what you are doing, stimulating the parotid hormone. We need all hands on deck to stimulate insulin. So it's upregulated and the other is downregulated. So high sucrose diets halt or even revert. Oh yeah, did that. Brain and liver cells. This is really interesting. Brain and liver cells, and all the MDs will know this, do not require insulin for glucose uptake. So this halting effect on the dentinal fluid flow by a high sucrose diet can be manipulated. They found that if they uh, put carbamyl phosphate or things such as eggshells in the diet of their lab animals, that they could reduce the caries experience even in the face of a high sucrose diet. Now, they analyzed what an eggshell was. No, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium. They supplemented that. Didn't make any difference. It didn't change the caries experience. We also found that dentin apposition is also downregulated when the dentinal fluid flow is reduced in teeth that are forming. Leonora and, there's that name again, Tadarhani in 2002. Tadarhani was working at the University of British Columbia when he was introduced to them. He knew that some teeth had harder dentin than others. Some people have soft teeth. They probably do. All right? A developing tooth can be compromised in its quality before it even erupts, which could create significant susceptibility to early childhood caries. So while traditional paradigms are looking what's causing early childhood caries after the tooth erupts, it's already set up by the diet prior to the eruption of the tooth. So we have another question answered. Why are some children more susceptible to early childhood caries? It's because of the development of the tooth, not what happens in the mouth. How do we define our business? Are dentists defining their business as driving trains, or sorry, restoring teeth? Or are we looking at moving people in cargo? Are we looking at creating a healthy situation for our clients or patients so they can have healthy teeth. It starts well before the tooth erupts into the mouth. In that book, Dentinal Fluid Transport, John Leonora wrote in the foreword of that book in 2005. Both Steinman and Leonora have passed away now. 
But, and this you won't find this in the research papers because this is all they're thinking. He says, an important question, quote, an important question that presently remains unresolved is, what is the nature of the inhibitory effect of the sucrose diet that leads to the impairment of the dentinal fluid transport mechanism that contributes to an increase in karyogenesis? Big unanswered question. So, now we have a breakthrough discovery, and at least on behalf of me, an epiphany. Reactive oxygen species are not just the exhaust of energy production. They are signals. They are the canary in the mine shaft. Essentially, reactive oxygen species not only trigger insulin, as Corinne Laloupe had found in her diabetic research, but they're the triggers for parotid hormone control by the hypothalamus. So visualize what's happening. The brain absorbs glucose immediately without the need for insulin. To burn off the excess glucose, metabolism increases, throw an extra log on the fire. Metabolism increases, which creates more reactive oxygen species. Oxidative stress builds in the hypothalamus from the reactive oxygen species and other free radicals. Reduction of parotid stimulating hormone in the hypothalamus and decreased parotid hormone from the parotid glands stops or reverses the dentinal fluid flow, creating vulnerability in the tooth as it starts to act more like a sponge. So now we can answer Dr. Leonora's question. The nature of the inhibitory effect of the sucrose diet is to increase the rate of reactive oxygen species in the mitochondria of the hypothalamus. Oxidative stress increases and initiates signaling almost immediately. But with Steinman and Leonora, they said, well, why does carbamylphosphate, and if we feed the uh, lab animals eggshells, why does that manipulate the dentinal fluid flow? Well, we find that carbamylphosphate is an anion carrying two uncoupled electrons that it can donate like an antioxidant. And eggshells were effective because the membrane in the eggshell is rich in antioxidants. Nature wants to do everything to protect its best prize of new life. So it surrounds it with a bubble of antioxidant-rich membrane. So, let's summarize. The steps in the systemic paradigm of dental caries. Ingest sugar. Tooth is sweating, no problem. Goes down, absorbed in the gut, increased blood glucose, and increases reactive oxygen species in the hypothalamus. Down regulates parotid stimulating hormone from the hypothalamus, creates decreased production of parotid hormone in the endocrine portion of the parotid glands, creates a halting or reversing of the dentinal fluid flow as it switches from a sweating tooth to a sponge. Plaque and karyogenic bacteria can now stick or adhere to the tooth. More sucrose will feed the bacteria to produce more acid. Enamel demineralization and dentin ir irritation begin. Dentin inflammation is engaged and proceeds from the acute phase to chronic levels or a cavity. The three lines in red refer to the acidogenic paradigm of dental disease. You've got bacteria, feed them sugar, and susceptible tooth surface. So, Miller's acidogenic theory was not wrong. It's just totally inadequate to explain the caries process. And it will be extremely frustrating working with the three red lines to actually make a difference in the dental caries uh, activity. <clears throat> so what's happening beyond the enamel in the dentin and why? 
controlled and particularly uncontrolled inflammation stimulated by any acid irritants begin the dent and caries process when the tooth is vulnerable. In other words, acids from citrus and uh, bulimia can cause dental caries if the tooth is already vulnerable. Nourishment is cut off when that uh, fluid flow stops and immune resources are depleted. Uh, acids from carbohydrate consuming oral bacteria and soda pop are most devastating because the sugary diet has reversed that fluid flow and decreased the tooth's resistance through an endocrine response. Crystal meth has a storm, and cigarettes too, a storm of free radicals in the hypothalamus which decreases the resistance of the tooth and that's why crystal meth causes meth mouth or so much caries devastation because the tooth, the teeth are rendered totally vulnerable to any acid attack. The Asian paradox. A paradox, of course, is when you do something, you expect one thing and something else happens is different. So they noticed in Asia, they had increased dental caries in smokers. Well, we kind of expect that, but a decreased rate when they consumed more and more green tea. Well, the dentists in the group thought, this is great. We can, we can show them that's the fluoride in green tea that's making all the difference. So they took the fluoride out of the green tea and there wasn't any difference. And they couldn't explain it. That's why it's a paradox. But now when we take a systemic viewpoint, we can entirely, it's not a paradox at all. It's easy to explain why the antioxidants in the green tea were squelching the free radicals created by smoking. So we see the role of antioxidants to prevent caries, particularly exogenous ones. <clears throat> so dentin caries is simply a predictable response to a chronic stressor. Local adaptation syndromes are acute symptoms of inflammation, such as gingivitis and dentinitis, which would cause tooth sensitivity. Okay? You get plaque on your gums, a few days later they bleed, you clean, your, clean the plaque off your gums, the bleeding goes away. Doesn't involve the whole system, strictly local. A general adaptation syndrome involves the endocrine system through the hypothalamus. Eventual immune system exhaustion through constant abuse and lack of nourishment allows chronic inflammation to cause irreversible breakdown in the tooth and the periodontion. Inflammatory load. Thank you for your example yesterday, John, of Earl Campbell, the football player. They, one person tried to tackle him. Another person finally got six people on top of him and they finally brought him down. Inflammatory load. This is the crossroads. Inflammatory load links periodontal disease and dental caries to other inflammatory diseases. So, anything the dental team can do to reduce inflammation is going to have a ripple effect to those inflammatory diseases such as cardiovascular disease and diabetes. Anything our physician, osteopath, and naturopathic friends and nutritional friends can do to reduce inflammation is also going to have a beneficial ripple effect to dental disease. So we now know the systemic aspects of the dental caries process. What can we do about it? <clears throat> so, there is evidence to support the role of nutrition to enhance dental health. And now we turn to the, I don't believe could ever be duplicated, research of Dr. Weston Price. You heard of Weston Price's name several times in this uh, seminar. Uh, what most don't know is he was the chair of the American Dental Association's research committee from 1914 to 1928. This man knew how to do research. Okay? His seminal work is published in the book Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, now in its eighth printing from the Price Pottinger Nutrition Foundation. There's the book. See all those smiling faces, no caries, no orthodontic problems. This should be in everyone's library. <clears throat> 
Price knew that he wanted to, if he wanted to prove anything nutritional, he had to have a randomized controlled trial. The, the gold standard. He would have to designate both a control group and a study group, and he'd have to try to minimize the confounding factors. Things such as latitude, altitude, age, fluoridation, income, smoking, dental care. How would we do that today? The only difference would generally be the diet and specifically the key nutrients. So he was able to determine 14 primitive groups on the cusp of civilization. These were specifically selected groups, some from the north, some from the south, some from high altitudes, some from sea level, and so on. Most significantly though, a part of the group had to be exposed to a modern diet. They became the study group. And the other part of the primitive group had to be still on the primitive diet. They were the control group. So Price charted the percentage of teeth attacked by caries in both the primitive control groups and the modernized or study groups. And this chart is reprodu reproduced with the uh, permission of the Price Pottinger Nutrition Foundation. Let's look at it. First of all, the most important thing to realize is the difference in percentages between the primitives and the modernized. Take the Swiss, for example. 4.6% of their teeth were decayed originally, and the modernized group, 29.8%. Almost seven times as much dental decay in the modernized group. Go on down, we get down to Australian Aborigines. Look at that one. No dental decay at all in the primitive group, and 71% of their teeth decayed in the modernized group. How did this happen? So, let's, let's take the Swiss, for example. Here you have this isolated valley in the Swiss Alps. Very difficult to get in or, in or out. So the people living in that valley designed a self-sustaining uh, culture. They sent their cattle up into the, the Alps in the, in the summertime. You could hear the cowbells ring. They went up and they milked them. Uh, they grew oats and rye. And uh, they lived a pretty simple life. Uh, they knew, they knew that any milk... Uh, that was gathered in late June when the grass was growing quickly could be made into butter which was or more orange in color and was a very prized possession. Then they put a tunnel through to that valley which made it readily accessible to the city. Now you had some people that said, hey, I'm not interested in changing my lifestyle but others said, I'm going into the city and they became modernized. And there's the difference in the Carey's experience. The Gaelics on the west coast of Scotland, living on those small islands, living in their peat huts, and living off seafood, had 1.2% of their teeth decayed, but then they found it, the other end of the island became a whaling port. So you had ships going through all the time. Now you got 30% of the people on the modernized end of the island on down, mostly trade routes exposed these primitive cultures to a modernized diet. So Price was able to determine that for them. In his nutrition, he identified that the fat-soluble vitamins A and D to be critical factors, as well as the mysterious activator X. Something had to activate these guys to get them really to perform. And in the diet, of, they found that activator X in the diet of the primitives who had relatively little dental caries. The primitive diet was more significant than just not having refined carb carbohydrates like the moderns had. It provided many more minerals. Price had food samples sent back to his lab in Cleveland for years. He also measured calcium, phosphorus, iron, magnesium, copper, iodine, and fat-soluble vitamins, and found to be many times higher in the primitive diets. This man was truly an outstanding researcher. He knew that activator X, the thing that initiated these things, pardon the name, could be found in the fat of grass-fed cattle, like in Switzerland that we talked about. But he never knew what it was. Like Steinman and Leonora, Price died leaving a big unanswered question. What is 
activator X. 60 years after his death, in 2007, it was the relationship of activator X to vitamin K2 was finally made. K2, or menaquinone, as it's known, is that research is not new. There was a lot of research on menaquinone in cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, and diabetes research, mostly in Europe and Asia. Kate Rayon Blue, a Canadian uh, naturopath, actually wrote a book, K2 and the Calcium Paradox. Show you the book right there. I like the little thing on the bottom. It says, how a little known vitamin could save your life. Okay? So, K2 is formed through the process of fermentation by select bacteria. Natto, or fermented soy, is the richest natural food source and is common in Asia. Not at all in the North American diet. Cattle can ferment K2 in their, with their gut bacteria. They have four stomachs, lots of time in there, especially when fed rapidly growing green grass. Remember those Swiss cattle. Milk fat and butter contain it because of the fat, the fat content of those. Fermented bacteria ferment cheese and mesophilic yogurts contain K2. Thermophilic yogurts the kind we see in the stores don't contain K2. The reason is that they start that process with heating it, which kills the bacteria that produce the K2. Mesophilic yogurts, such as Caspian Sea yogurt and Philip Jolk uh, uh, Scandinavian yogurt, do not use a heat process to start, it does not use heat to start the process. Chickens, egg yolks, some egg yolks, can, are good sources of K2, but not all. In other words, chickens have to consume the K2. So the ones that are pecking around in the barnyard eating bugs and bacteria and all that, they have K2 in their egg yolks. The ones that are cage fed with a fixed diet are not such good sources. So K2, while it's been around for a while, is only new to dentistry when we have a systemic outlook on the caries process. A brief description of K2, it can be formed in the liver in small amounts from K1, which is why it got its name, of the K vitamin. Phylloquinone, or K1, of course, we know is the clotting vitamin. K1 is so important to us, we need to clot, okay, that your body has found a way to recycle it. So if you, give, if you want to create an anti-clotting situation in a person, you give them warfarin, Coumadin, and it interferes with the recycling process. And they'll tell you, sir, don't eat a lot of green leafy vegetables to increase the exogenous source. Just eat the regular amount, but we're going to interfere with the recycling, reduce K1, and reduce the clotting ability. K2 is not recycled and only produced in small amounts. So it must be in the diet. In other words, we're more like chickens than we are like cattle. Different forms of K2. K2 is a molecule that has side chains. If it has four side chains off it, it's known as menaquinone 4. If it has seven side chains off it, it's known as menaquinone 7. MK4 is the type that is synthesized in the body. It is the type that's found in egg yolks and butter. MK7 is the one produced by the bacteria, so it's found 90% of natto and a large extent of fermented cheeses have MK7. Supplementation usually uses MK7, usually from a natto source. The advantage of that is that MK7 has a longer half-life, so it lasts longer in the body. So, and we know with compliance, if you're going to convince a person to take a pill once a day or two or three times a day, you're better off with once. So if you needed three capsules spread out over the day of MK4, your chances of compliance are less than one capsule of MK7. The role 
of vitamin K2. It is integral to the carboxylation cycle of proteins, proteins which have been formed by vitamins A and D. Examples are osteocalcin, found in bones, and matrix GLA, found in arteries and cardiovascular tissues. So therefore, K2 activates these proteins to perform the way they're supposed to happen and direct calcium. So activated osteocalcin by K2, lots of K2, activated osteocalcin attracts calcium. Unactivated osteocalcin releases calcium and leads to osteoporosis. On the opposite side of that, activated matrix GLA proteins reject calcium. We don't want you here. We got lots of K2. We don't want you here. So your arteries remain flexible. If you don't have enough K2 or it's unactivated, matrix GLA proteins attract calcium and leads to hardening of the arteries and cardiovascular problems. A little interesting little aside. So why do some egg yolks contain K2? Well, the chicken wants to use that K2, that calcium director, to mobilize calcium from the eggshell reservoir across that antioxidant-rich membrane and into the skeleton of the young chick. It really has no interest in feeding humans a nutritious diet. It's all about the skeleton of the chick. <clears throat> so calcium and, v and vitamin D supplementation can increase heart disease and not help bones without the help of K2. This was the calcium paradox. Hey, we're doing a good thing. A person has osteoporosis. Take calcium and D3 to help its absorption. And then, oh my God, we got an entirely different and maybe even a worse result. We got cardiovascular disease. This is a paradox. It's not a paradox at all. It is totally understandable when you understand the, the purpose of K2. What they were short of was K2, all right? K2 also is known to influence insulin sensitivity. The pancreas and salivary glands have high concentrations of K2. What a surprise. It has a role in developing teeth or dentinogenesis, which is what Tadarhani and Leonora found, and also bones. We don't have time to talk about what Price found relative to the orthodontic nature of these primitives. Remember they had broad smiling faces? The ones on K2 had broad arches, broad hips, no birthing problems, no orthodontic problems. K2 has also been recognized that it has an antioxidant role in the oligodendrocytes and neurons certainly suggest that K2 could have a major role in the endocrine aspects of dental caries process as an antioxidant. This would be similar to the EGCG epigallocatin gallate of green tea. But most research has been done on the effects of K2 to regulate insulin and manage metabolic syndrome. Dentistry hasn't even got to this stage of research yet. For those who are interested, supplement dosage by a capsule is 120 micrograms of MK7 per day, plus, as Price found, many times more minerals in the diets of the primitive, you'd want to take a high quality multivitamin mineral along with it. <clears throat> so, enough for the inside of the tooth. Teeth are always also nourished from the outside by saliva. Price also studied the content and pH of saliva relative to the fat-soluble vitamins such as A, D, and activator X, and minerals, calcium and phosphorus. Better nutrition provided a higher oral pH, a more alkaline environment, and decreased strep mutans bacteria. Telgi in 2013 did a project that uh, took a, a sample group, they gave them milk, Another one yogurt, another one cheese. The milk and yogurt groups elevated the pH in the plaque, but after 30 minutes, it returned to baseline. So for it, they didn't cause cavities. 
So he called it non-karyogenic. The cheese group, however, remained elevated. So he called it anti-karyogenic. But given the acidogenic paradigm, they were hard pressed to explain why that was. And they thought, well, maybe it's because you have to chew the cheese that that's why it was. Very easy for us in this room to understand why. There was probably an absorption of K2 across the membrane, which, uh, which, uh, 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 which didn't happen in the yogurt, because the yogurt was a thermophilic yogurt. So in the cheese test group, was there a more alkaline promoting composition of saliva due to K2 absorption uh, across the mucous membrane? Was, it was a qualitative effect, not just quantitative. A K2 supplement could provide the answer. So what would you do if you were going to redo this experiment? Well, you would put milk and yogurt and cheese and you'd use a little liposome spray I believe this is where nutritionals are going, liposome sprays. You would spray a little liposome K2 and D3 into the mouth of those with the milk and the yogurt to supplement the K2 and see whether the caries, see where they then become anti-karyogenic, to see where that plaque pH remains high. So let's review the initial questions. Why aren't acids karyogenically equal? We now know. The first three, simply a local effect. The last two, usually associated with an endocrine uh, systemic response. Why can not, we cannot create dentin and carry in vitro and after the death of the host? Because there's no inflammatory response. Why does crystal meth cause so much caries devastation? Because of the free radical storm in the hypothalamus, making the teeth totally vulnerable. Why is milk non-karyogenic while keys cheese is anti-karyogenic? It's because of the K2 content. And why are some children more susceptible to early childhood caries with a fluid flow through the tooth before it ever erupts? You get a higher quality dentin in the tooth. The systemic theory of causation of dental decay. Where are we now? Or maybe she would ask, where were we one hour ago? Where might we go? Should we embrace a systemic paradigm? How do we get there? Is nutrition a vehicle or is it the vehicle? Why would we go there? Can dental physicians afford not to? We close with the words of Ralph Waldo Emerson. The mind, once stretched by a new idea, never returns to its original dimensions. The future is yours to create. Thank you.